On the green diamond, as silence rings loud across the stadium, everyone's eyes are on the pitcher. Everyone on the field can be seen clear as day. Everyone except one player. The man behind the plate tends to blend in, obscure between the batter and home plate umpire. Squatted, eager with one hand raised up, ready to catch a projectile flying towards him at speeds of up to 100 miles an hour. Baseball has been around in the United States since the 18th century. It's been America's national pastime for close to 200 years. And just like apple pie and enormous food portions, it's as American as it gets. By most calculations, well over 20,000 men have played in the MLB since its inception in 1903. Several of those players have gone on to become legends of the game. Remembered for being funny, temperamental, captivating, tough, lovable, or just outright neurotic. There's one, however, who stands out yet blends in like none other. The one player who everyone was familiar with, yet no one really knew. The man who sat squat, mask covering his face, seeing everything on the field from his vantage point, yet barely visible himself. One man who was quite possibly the biggest enigma in all of sports. Major League Baseball catcher and World War II American spy, Moberg. The third and youngest child of Bernard Berg and Rose Tashker, Mo was born and raised Jewish in Harlem, New York City. Berg was a child prodigy with an aptitude well beyond his years and at the age of three and a half, begged his mother to let him start school. Baseball record books list Mo as being born on March the 2nd, 1902, while Mo's birth certificate lists May the 3rd, 1902 as his date of birth. Mo was only a nickname. His actual name was Morris. However, his birth certificate shows his actual name as Moses. This would become a pattern in Mo's life. There would only be a couple of people that would know the real Moberg. His life's work, his education, his job, and his later life would be shrouded in mystery, with muddled facts and missing timelines. Mo began playing baseball at the age of seven for the Roseville Methodist Episcopal Church baseball team, under the pseudonym Runtwolf. Berg's father, for reasons known, but mostly unknown, settled in non-Jewish neighborhoods, while Mo and his siblings were sent to Christian schools. Upon graduating from Barringer High School, Mo enrolled in NYU and spent two semesters there while also playing baseball and basketball. In 1919, he transferred to Princeton University and never again mentioned his year at NYU, presenting himself as an exclusive Princeton man. Mo received a BA magna cum laude in modern languages, studying Latin, Greek, French, Spanish, Italian, German, and Sanskrit, while never truly fitting into the Princeton social life due to his Jewish heritage and modest finances. In the early 1920s, the Brooklyn Robins, who would later go on to rename themselves as the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1932, started scouting and signing Jewish players to appeal to the large Jewish community in New York and expressed interest in Mo. The New York Giants were another team in the market looking for Jewish players and showed interest as well, but already had two solid shortstops, Dave Bancroft and Travis Jackson, both of whom would go on to become Hall of Famers. The Robins were successful in their chase and Mo signed his first major league contract for 5,000 US dollars with the Brooklyn Robins. Mo spent 15 seasons in the major leagues. An average player at best, Mo had a respectable batting average of .243 with 441 hits and 206 runs batted in. He'd spent time playing for the Brooklyn Robins, Chicago White Sox, Cleveland Indians and Washington Senators and finished his career with his last five major league seasons spent in Boston with the Red Sox. In the winter of 1932, Mo was sent on an assignment alongside two other baseball players to Japan to teach baseball seminars at Japanese universities. As the assignment finished and other Americans came back home, Mo stayed back to explore Japan further and went on to tour Manchuria, Shanghai, Peking, Indochina, Siam, India, Egypt and Berlin. In 1934, a group of all-stars including legends like Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Earl Avril, Charlie Gehringer and Lefty Gomez were picked to tour Japan for exhibition games against a Japanese all-star team. 
Mo made the team at the last minute and on his way to Japan picked up a 16mm Bell & Howell movie camera from Movie Tone News, a New York City newsreel production company. On November 29, 1934, while the rest of the team played in Moya, Mo went to St. Luke's Hospital in Tsukiji, ostensibly to visit the daughter of American Ambassador Joseph Grew. Instead, Mo went up to the roof of the hospital, one of the tallest buildings in Tokyo, and filmed the entire city and harbor with his movie camera. This footage would later prove fruitful for American intelligence, with never-before-seen photos of the city. Mo never met the ambassador's daughter that day. On December 7, 1941, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. The United States of America was now completely involved in World War II. On January 5, 1942, Mo accepted a position with Nelson Rockefeller's office of the Coordinator of Inter-American Affairs. During the summer of 1942, Mo screened the footage of Tokyo that he had captured almost a decade ago for intelligence officers of the United States military. From August of 1942 until Feb of 1943, Mo was assigned in the Caribbean and South America to monitor the health and fitness of American troops stationed there. He left soon thereafter wanting to be signed in locations where his talents would be put to better use. On August 2, 1943, Mo accepted a position in the Office of Strategic Services Special Operations Branch. He went from being assigned as a paramilitary operations officer in the OSS to the OSS's Secret Intelligence Branch, being given a spot on the OSS SI Balkans desk. In this remote role based in Washington, D.C., Mo monitored the situation in Yugoslavia and assisted and helped prepare the Slavic Americans recruited by the OSS to go on dangerous parachute drop missions in Yugoslavia. In late 1943, Mo was assigned to Project Larsen, an OSS operation whose objective was to kidnap Italian rocket and missile specialists in Italy and bring them to the US. Another project hidden within Project Larsen was called Project Azusa, or AZUSA whose goal was to interview Italian physicists to learn what they knew about the German nuclear program, and in particular two men, Carl Friedrich von Weissacker and Werner Heisenberg. From May to mid-December of 1944, Mo traveled around Europe, interviewing physicists and trying to convince them to leave Europe and work for the American government. Mo was assigned to attend a lecture being given by Heisenberg in Zurich. He was under order to attend the lecture and determine if anything Heisenberg said could convince him that the Germans were close to a nuclear bomb. If Mo were to conclude that the Germans were close to a bomb, he had strict orders to shoot Heisenberg. In the end, Mo concluded that the Germans were nowhere near close. He resigned from the OSS after the war in January of 1946. Post-World War II, the myth of Moberg grows as not much is known about his personal life. In 1951, he begged the CIA, which had replaced the OSS, to send him to the recently founded nation of Israel. The CIA rejected Mo's request, and in 1952, Mo was hired again by the CIA to use his old contacts from World War II to gather intel on the Soviet atomic bomb project. But he'd come up empty-handed with no such intel, and the CIA officer who spoke to Mo upon his return from Europe recalled Mo as being flaky. For the next 20 years of his life, Mo never held a real job. Living off friends and relatives who had put up with him due to his charisma, when asked what he did for a living, Mo would reply by putting his finger to his lips, giving an impression that he was still a spy. He lived with his brother Samuel for 17 years as a bachelor, and when eventually asked to evict the premises, moved in with his sister Ethel in Belleville, New Jersey, where he spent the remaining years of his life. On May 29, 1972, Moberg passed away from injuries sustained in a fall at his home. He was 70 years old. At the Belleville, New Jersey hospital where he passed away, a nurse recalled his final words as, How did the Mets do today? The Mets had won their game that day. By his request, his remains were cremated and spread over Mount Scopus in Jerusalem. Mo was known for being the brainiest guy in baseball, but no one put it better than legendary Hall of Fame player and coach Casey Stengel who once described Moberg as the strangest man ever to play baseball.